What's up, guys? Dirty Mike with Dirty Mike Crypto back here with the inaugural video in our new series, Dirty Mike's Dirty Dozen. Today, I have the privilege of having the CEO of EverReflect Token on with me today, EJ. Uh, let's all give it up for EJ here. How you what doing up, today? Dirty Mike? Hey, hey, I'm glad to have you on as my first guest. Dude, I'm so excited to be here. I love your videos. I love what you're doing in the space. And I just think it's a, it, this is a cool addition to the resources you already offer. So thank awesome. you for having me. I think it'll give people the chance to, you know, get to know you, not just as a professional, but as a person as well. And uh, let's get started. <laughs> yeah, your questions I know are going to be a little bit, a little bit more unique. So I'm excited. Believe it or not, they're not as uh, not as bad as you think. But uh, let's see what we got here. All righty, all right. So let's start with the first one here. How did you get involved in the crypto, EJ? Um, yeah, actually, we were talking about this earlier. So my first experiences uh, in the crypto space were with Bitcoin. Um, I think, like a lot of people, were right around probably 2016 timeframe. Um, my best friend is actually a very successful uh, Texas Hold'em player, played in the World Series of Poker. And he he suggested that uh, I get an account on Bovada. And that was when I had to get Coinbase. And that's when I had to get a wallet and, and uh, buy some Bitcoin. Oh, man. Back, yeah. at, uh, back at a rate of $700 a coin oh. and transfer it over to... Um, <laughs> transfer it over to Bovada. And I, it's funny, I can go back into my Coinbase now and still look at those first transactions. And I'm like, oh, I bought that at $700 a coin. So, and then after that, my brother, Adam and I ended up delving a lot more into like the, the, the tutorials they had on Coinbase. And I'm a, I'm a nerd for learning. So that was yeah, kind I of think the, that was a kind of cool thing that they did where they kind of paid you a little bit, gave you like a little bit of knowledge. But uh, me personally, I'm not right. a big fan of Coinbase personally. But uh, No, and I don't use Coinbase, uh, not obviously almost hardly at all now. Um, but, you know, I will say this, the, the nice part about Coinbase and the platforms like that and Robinhood, it, 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 it's really a nice, easy barrier to entry for a lot of new people trying to get into the, the you know, even delve into crypto for just, uh, um, you know, for the first time. Yeah, it does. And it gives you a little bit of education with it, too, which is good. I definitely feel like, uh, you know, investors, especially in crypto, sometimes kind of come in a little bit undereducated. And I think if you can get a little bit of education, you know, before you start, I think it's uh, I think it's beneficial to all. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, the education of how it, how blockchain works and how, you know, automatic uh, uh, liquidity generators, uh, all that kind of stuff works and just getting the concept of reflections and rewards and taxation and uh, that, you know, some some people just even the education of knowing that there's multiple blockchains yeah. and there, there's so much in the space that that education really is the key. Awesome, man. That awesome. Now, the next question, what moment led you to deciding to found Ever Reflect? Like, what was like that turning point moment where you're like, that's it, I'm doing it? Yeah, I mean, last last year, uh, Fritz and I getting heavily involved into Save Moon, and then um, seeing kind of the, the success of EGC. And I love both of those concepts. I love both of the uh, the reflections and reward tokens. Um, and it led to just the idea of like, Hey, I wonder why they didn't do this with the math. And so then we look at the, the presale and calculate that, or what would you, what would happen with this, with the liquidity pool at this level, or what would happen, you know, and it was just dad and I basically going back and forth and just crunching numbers. And, and then I, I shared it with one of our board members, William, and, and the cool part about uh, William's response was he's like, yeah, he, we should try this. And and then as as the community of like uh, crypto enthusiasts that I was a part of in Telegram, I slowly kind of showed it to them. Everybody was supportive. And then, then all of a sudden we had a foundation. Yeah. And one of our other 
uh, now board members, uh, BP was, was like, you know, what about NFTs? And I was like, I am not a fan of NFTs. I'm like, there's no, I don't see, see a logical purpose for them. But then it opened up uh, the concept of discussion, discussing, well, you're in entertainment, you know, you worked in, in the, uh, the festival and entertainment space for 20 years. What if, what if there was something like NFT tickets? And then it, then it really exploded because then it was like, Oh, wow. We can yeah. use it for this and this. And yeah, right. like this is going to merge crypto. Like two of my favorite passions outside of like ancient aliens I'm like, dude, we could yeah. do entertainment and crypto together. That to me was the 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 breaking point. I'm like, done. Full full fledged. You know, you can you can get excited about it and then you can work on it with great people. And then it could be something that could actually really really be utilized by the masses in in a real world setting, not just like, oh, you know, you should trade this utility token. Now it was like, oh, I want to go to this comedy show or I want to go to the sporting event. And then you do a little bit of research and you start seeing like, oh, Coachella is doing NFT tickets with Solana. Uh, the NFL is offering like NFT uh, additions to the tickets you buy for like Thanksgiving Day football games. Like the, the, the world is already moving slowly in that direction and we're right at the beginning of it. So that was the, the tipping point for me. Gotcha. Giorgio, if you're listening from Ancient Aliens, I'm writing a note down here. We're getting you oh on the Dirty Dozen. We're getting that would you, be. We're getting you and your hair on the Dirty Dozen, and it will be. We should also time. invite. We should also invite Josh Gates from Expedition Unknown. Yeah, we'll get Josh on too. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. That'd be awesome. All right. So, next question: What has been your greatest challenge so far that you didn't expect or plan for? with launching a token? Um, I, I think, so I'm a very strategic planner and kind of have been for a long, long time. And I think the, it wasn't really unexpected, but the biggest challenge is to still stick to your, your ground, right? Like, okay, this is the strategic plan. This is the timeline we're going to implement x on youtube here and we're going to implement x here on these socials and then we're going to do this release of tokens or this release of the store and so the the timeline even though it's not necessarily all laid out uh for public viewing the timeline's already laid out within the team and within the core and especially on my calendar and and sticking to that because the the idea of crypto being so fast and i know People have heard me say this a thousand times, but the dog years of crypto are what create so many uh, opportunities for scammers to move in mm -hmm. and making sure that we're sticking to our guns and sticking to our plan of doing this with our strategic timeline and not deviating from that is, is a big, it's, it's more of a challenge than I thought it was going to be because then there's certain times that you're like, oh, maybe we should try to rush this but yeah, because you get the and, pressure from the community you know and that kind of stuff can almost make you second guess it right and but but when everything's said and done you have to test things you have to do things correctly and rushing it never it's like making a turkey on thanksgiving like just because you want it in an hour you still have to cook it for 46 hours like you still have to do the due diligence of taking your time and doing it correctly because that's how it comes out perfect. And yep. so that's, that's really where we're sticking to our guns about doing it according to our strategic plan. All right. That sounds good. Let's lighten it up a little bit. So uh -oh. tell everybody a passion of yours that is not crypto related. We all know you're into, you know, the concert venue and everything that you, you know, you've been in with the concert space and live events. Tell us all something <laughs> about yours. It's not crypto or concert related um well one thing i actually do that would probably maybe even surprise some people is that um our family owns another business that is associated with like uh, interior home goods um you know renovations construction and i have a love for 
building barn doors. Really? Like interior interior barn doors. Yeah, like when when you get like knotty pine and it has tongue and groove and then you can whitewash it and then I end up buying like the hardware separately and um, you know, the average barn door is 84 inches tall because of the fact that it has to be above the door jam. And then usually they'll be 36 to 48 inches wide and you can get the, the cast iron hardware and you can mount it up on the wall. So I, there's a lot of that stuff that I actually have done over uh, the last few years of building my own doors, whitewashing them, staining them, um, customizing them. And yeah, just kind of a random hobby, but it's, it's, it's relaxing for me. Like it's one of those things that, uh, you're, you're off of. You can just shut your brain off, of, off and just enjoy it right. and just get into it. Yeah, yeah. I dig that. Yeah. Just put on some music and then, yeah, but that, that is actually, and I actually have a, uh, a, a massive warehouse where, where like if you were to go in and see like all of the interior doors and front doors and windows and all the stuff that's being built and uh uh the, the number of pallets and stuff but yeah that, most people don't know that but i actually do have a, a very nice uh kind of <laughs> utility warehouse where i do a lot of that work that's awesome man. not that's as much awesome. the last couple months but that's great i mean that gets people to know a little bit about you that's not you know business or crypto related that's cool yeah that that is yep Naughty pine, that <laughs> naughty <Tony> pine. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty non crypto. Yeah, you don't get any more crypto than naughty pine. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. All right, so how did you go about? We, I know you kind of mentioned a little bit about this earlier, but how did you go about choosing your team at Ever Reflect, your core team? Yeah, so uh, Stu, well, obviously, the core team started with my dad and my brother because we've been in the space together uh trading tokens for a long time um and then Stu is actually a good friend and colleague from uh the festival industry that he's built a lot of web websites for um, companies that i associated with or work for um so that was kind of how the the first four got set up and then honestly the the next nine uh, board of director directors were from my core group of guys that I will trade tokens with and that we would go into certain launches or try to get into white lists or, you know, we might, uh, we might collectively buy into a token or trade a token. Um, there was a group of about 30 of us and the, the nine that I had built the best rapport with back in like, you know, September, October, those are the ones that were kind of, um, you know, tapped on the shoulder, like, would you be interested in this? And is this something that you're willing to take on the, um, not just the benefits, but also the, the work that goes into it. And, and every single one of them, you know, said, heck yeah, without a doubt. And the nice part was that gave us the opportunity to spread our board of directors around the globe, everything from the United States to like over in Europe to just really every time zone is basically represented because of the fact that, you know, crypto is so, so global that it, it gave us the opportunity to really spread it out with multiple gifts and multiple talents from multiple people around the, around the planet. Awesome. Hear it here first. Ever Reflect is committed to diversification. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it's the best way that you end up getting different insights from so many different aspects of the world that you can't otherwise. And I've always been a big world traveler and I, you know, other cultures and other locations have so much to learn because it's so different than kind of the bubble that everybody has to live in because you're located in one area for a period of time, but it's so good to push your limits and challenge yourself to be able to explore and see other places. And that's exactly what crypto allows you to, you know, vicariously do. By beating or by meeting and in, in, uh, uh, building rapport with with people around the planet, I mean, I love that aspect of it. Yeah, man, that's that's definitely awesome. So, how do you think that Ever Reflect can make it easier for a new investor in the crypto to purchase and get involved in the space? Well, I I think you know it's not just it's not just Ever Reflect. 
as much as it is all all tokens being traded on BSC right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I obviously always want people to choose Ever Reflect. I think that because we have a fifteen percent BUSD reward and only a seventeen percent tax, the the liquidity pool that backs up our market cap, the amount of circulating tokens. I think all of our metrics are are better, far better than a lot of other tokens. But the the biggest thing from my perspective is that we're such a small fraction being traded on our blockchain. If there's only 2 million wallets out of 300 million traders globally, you know, that's 298 million people that have some sort of association with Dogecoin or Bitcoin or Ethereum. And they're not even associated with BNB at all. Right. And, and I think our best opportunity as we create more tutorials and as we create more videos about wallets with meta, with trust and simplifying the process of, you know, being able to trade not only a token that is just on BSC, but to trade a reflection token. Um, it's not the, the learning curves there and it's more, but from the, the partnerships that we're building and from doing things like this, that going back to the education being key, we want to under we want to be able to uh, explain it in a way that it's systematic in the steps of like okay you have a wallet now all right let's take a break let's get some BNB into that wallet mm-hmm. okay let's take a, let's take a break let me show you Pancake Swap or Poo Coin or Flues Trade now let me show you how to import a custom token like. There's seven or eight steps that go through the process of being able to get a utility token. I know in I wrote them. Out. I wrote it out wallet. on paper. I wrote it out on paper one time, and I just looked at it. I'm like, man, this is crazy. Mm-hmm. Well, if you if you take a look at like the video we have for um, setting up a new trust wallet, and then getting BNB into that trust wallet, and then buying uh, Ever Reflect on Flues Trade. Like it's a four minute video and that's completely spliced down to every step being fairly quick and no delays. And so if it takes four minutes for a video to just show it at the fastest rate possible to do it, it's going to take the average person maybe 20, 30, 60 minutes to even be able to process it. And, And I really just hope that people that are in this space We'll go out and help other people to do it because that learning curve is definitely scary for a lot of people. And you might not be able to watch a video and comprehend and get it all. So to be able to show people how to do it is is the biggest critical factor. And I also think that there's so many opportunities for people that that want to onboard people. Like that's a part of this industry that, you know, you don't see too many like uh, you see telegram groups for AMAs and you see telegram groups for certain education or shilling, but how many telegram groups do you see like, Hey, we're just going to help people get new wallets and get BME into their wallet. Like that's a service. That's something that really is almost needed in this space to get, Hey, you have Robin hood. Let me show you how to just get BNB into a trust wallet. Yeah. That's, like, a, that, that, that's a good idea. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good idea that you brought up there. You're right. There isn't a lot. And that's definitely a space that needs to be filled. I'm right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's awesome, true, though. Man. That's good stuff. That's real good stuff. Let me ask you, do you think that regulation is good or bad for the crypto industry and why? Well, I think some regulation is needed. I think that it, it would be better because we kind of self-regulate ourselves now. If, if there was regulation, I wish that it could come from so, some sort of, you know, Uh, elected upon council of some sort that like helps to represent, you know, different blockchains and different tokens. And it'd be much more democratic than it being like, okay, this is like the almighty power that's all overseeing it. The other aspect is, is that, you know, we're, we're not a security, you know, we're, we're literally a utility token that's traded, you know, it's not even, it's not even an investment. It's just a trade and you're just a holder and it's just a utility token. We're a complete, we're property. I mean that we're defined, you know, in the United States basically as property. So with that aspect of it, 
you want to be able to look at uh, regulation from a standpoint of security for new tokens being created and launches and security for new holders. But you and I both know like the governments, not just the United States, all governments travel a bit slower and bipartisanship is something that's a struggle yeah, and is. usually it's for nefarious reasons. So I, I, I don't, I don't foresee. Oh, was that you? Uh, yeah. For some reason, my timer just went off at that point. It was really oh, gotcha. keep going, keep going. Um, so, so I don't know that I, I, I don't foresee, I, I see the, you know, the, the conversations about potentially executive orders coming down in the United States to be able to regulate Bit, Bitcoin and such. Um, I, I, I don't see it happening in a timeline that'll be affected even in the next, you know, six months to a year, even maybe even the next four years, because it's so hard to know how to be able to really regulate it because other than taking out crypto into fiat, you know, the nice part about DeFi is that wallets are, are not associated with an individual, right? They're not even associated with a company or they're not even associated with any kind of personal data. And that's the beauty of it is that you're, you're, you're protected by that veil of, of, you know, it's transparent in the sense that it's all publicly viewable on the block, but yeah. on the blockchain, right? But the nice part is, is that there's no, there's no, you know, social security number. There's no name. There's nothing that's completely associated to that account, other than really your twelve, your twelve passwords to get in. So just as easily as, you know, it would take a lot of trust. But say, say I were to give you a trust wallet that had been under my control and I give you those 12 passwords and then I just destroy those 12 passwords. Technically I don't have any ownership over it, but then how do you, how do you regulate that kind of ownership? Because, you know, now is it dirty mics or is it just living in crypto, you know, space because whoever can access it. Yeah. Right. Because it, realistically it's only whoever has those, those access points to be able to get into wallets. And that's why it is critical. People are protective of their, their passwords to be able to get in, but it's not associated with an individual and that's the beauty of it. So how do you regulate it? Yeah. If you don't, you don't know who owns it. So well, that, that, that's, what kind of, that's what kind of worries me about it. Like you kind of mentioned, you know, if we should have some sort of delegation that kind of can represent us as opposed to an executive order of people that do they really understand how the ins and outs of the industry and what is really needed to do this. Right. And, and you know that there's already lobbyists on behalf of some of the bigger ones because, you know, like a, a Bitcoin or an Ethereum, they, they have the capital to probably have you know, lobbyists that are in different governments, but, but I, I don't know. I don't know how you ever um, get to a point where it's managed, right. It's controlled by the people. Yeah. And then you have a board, like it's not going to be a simple, there's no simple answer for it. The only thing that I wish that there was in this space, especially for BSC is that there was some sort of way of true, transparency with legitimate projects but it's it still goes back to the team it still goes back to the trust and you know as much as people will probably say you know i can't stand looking at ej's face anymore i don't do it for the people that don't want to see my face i do it for all the people that need that reassurance of like we're still here we're still grounded you can still hear my voice you can still see my face you can still see the team I just want to see that what, orange canoe, man. That's all I want to see is that yeah, orange yeah. canoe. Well, it's a it's a sun dolphin kayak. Obviously, you don't even pay attention to, to what's in my living room. I guess not. I guess not. I'm just so enamored <laughs> with it in the background. <laughs> That's awesome. But we could go canoeing if you ever want to go. I actually no. I actually go kayaking a lot. Actually, uh, I yeah. I've tipped over canoes so many times. I'm too big and bulky for. Uh, for canoes i tip those over too yeah. much but kayaking I'll i don't the balancing in a in a canoe is definitely much harder than a kayak yeah no i'm, I'm not a big fan of uh, canoeing myself but uh, i'm more of a pond, i'm more of a pontoon guy let's be honest oh yeah we all are 
Okay, <laughs> so, so let me ask you, what is the end game or the goal that Ever Reflect wants to accomplish? I know you have a lot of steps along the way, but like, what's the end yeah. game to where when you reach that, you're going to be like, you know what? Yeah, this is really what I wanted to accomplish. I, I, honestly, it'll be, uh, you know, I've done events from anywhere from like, a hundred people to a thousand people to 8,000 people to a hundred thousand people over a weekend. So, um, my threshold for success would probably be in that range of like, uh, an NFT ticket at an event. It doesn't matter the event. It could be a soccer game. It could be a comedy show. It could be a concert. Um, but everybody had a, a seamless, ability to be able to purchase an NFT ticket with fiat, get it um, put into their wallet. Once they have the NFT ticket in their wallet, they can attend the event, they enjoy the event. And then after that event post that we have some metadata that's uploaded into those NFTs and it's either video or it's photos from, from the actual event. Cool. And then people can start sharing that on social media. Like I think the, just seamlessly being able to implement that will will just be will be just such a, like a, a glorious like oh this you know the the little bird is really uh, left the nest but now yeah. it's like really soaring and 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 then once you have that in place the ability for people to think creatively of how to utilize these NFT tickets and then what other metadata can you incorporate or is there a bonus because of a token or you know there's there's so many other smart, creative people that will be able to take that platform and take that concept and then implement it into other things. And it could be, you know, whether it's it's a, a cooking class or if they want to use it for a comedy night. But then it's also then it gives you access to be able to meet the person backstage. Like there's going to be so many other components that go into it. Yeah, And then you can sell and, it as a collectible, maybe, you know, there's just so right, many different right. things you can do. Right. And then the, the secondary market concept of like, you know, the person that ended up like minting those initially for for the the sale of their uh, their event. If there is an, an uptick in it as far as the secondary ticket pricing that they could they could then maybe, you know, generate an extra, you know, 10, 10 K or 20 K or Amazing. 1 K. It doesn't matter. But that that could be additional revenue that like the small artist or the small comedian or the person that was not expecting their, you know, their art class that they that they were teaching to be so, so popular and so well attended. And to me, be able to to even that that option for them to to see some secondary ticket revenue and the people that attended it were excited because they got the metadata like there's just there's so many cool aspects of where this can go to merge. And he, and you saw it again last night with the Super Bowl. Like look at how many crypto.com commercials there are with celebrities in between a, one the biggest sporting event in the United States. So like merging that cuz I'm such a massive sports fan too yeah. that you know crossing with entertainment and with sports and yeah, you know with with the crypto space and then then giving people the opportunity to even get their hands into uh, blockchain just a little bit, I think is going to be, I think it's going to be really a massive aspect because right now, unless you want to trade a token because you, you know, the value of being able to be a holder, that's the main reason why people are, are in the space. Now, this is one of those utilities that gives people, the opportunity to get into the space without having to be it, it's like they're getting into the space secondary as opposed to that's the primary reason they're getting into the space because they wanted to attend the event cool man that's that's, that's a great answer um this next question is more for me um i'm a big foodie <laughs> Uh, you know, being from Philadelphia yeah. and surprisingly, I live in the Greenville, South Carolina area, and it is a huge food area down here, surprisingly. I mean, yeah. just it's amazing. And I'm in heaven down here with it. So I'm curious to all my guests what their answers are going to be with this. What would you choose as your final meal? Last meal. You get to pick anything. Uh, final meal. I probably am going sushi. Sushi? Yeah. Really? Yeah, like I like that's honestly like 
my, I mean, it has to be good sushi and it has to be, and it would probably be something with uh, like a spicy, uh, either spicy salmon or spicy tuna roll with avocado, mm. uh, then eel on top and then eel sauce would probably, and maybe, maybe some tempura flakes. And that would probably be like, we used to, we used to, funny side note, we used to have an event that a group of buddies and I would call the Sushi Cup of Destiny. And that was in Chicago. And we would go to an all-you-could-eat sushi buffet. And you'd have teams of four. And the way it worked is that you, your team got to select three rolls for your team and then one roll for the other team. And then you, the team of four had to eat all four rolls. And that other team had to eat their four rolls. And at the end... Basically, if whoever finished their first four rolls first, that other team was on a five minute timer that they had to finish it. And we, what would happen is that you couldn't double up on any rolls that were on the menu because there was like 50 of them. Yeah, right. And we would go, we would go like 10, 11, 12, 13 rounds of this, Mike. Holy and we would man. get so, we would get so sick from eating I so much. I can imagine sick. the bathrooms would be fought over here. <laughs> oh my God. God. We, we had tickets to Lala, we had tickets to Lollapalooza one Lala. time. <laughs> and we got so, we got so fish sick that we literally didn't even attend the Saturday because we went, all went back and just like chilled in the hotel rooms because we couldn't move. And I, a couple of my buddies ate 82 pieces because yeah. you were Holy shit. Wow. I'm glad I yeah. asked this. I'm glad I asked that question. That, that I, just I completely still, shocked me. I, I didn't think you would go with sushi, but this you have a great I, story I, behind it. So that's <laughs> I, I think I still have my sushi cup of destiny. Uh, the sushi somewhere. cup of destiny. You hear it right mm. now. You need to have that on your next AMA. It on right next to you. I want to see the sushi cup. Everyone wants to see the sushi cup of destiny at this point. I will I will try to find that t-shirt and if nothing else, I'll at least share a photo from the Sushi Cup of Destiny. That would be absolutely amazing. Wow. I don't know how I topped mm -hmm. this one, but uh <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's kind of a <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> well, I asked these questions out of order. I, I wanted to lighten it up a bit because this next question is a little more serious, but uh, now I don't know how to pivot yeah. from this. I, I, you shook me. <laughs> <right now. laughs> I'm all discombobulated on this one. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, all you right. didn't expect the Sushi Cup of Destiny to hit you, did you? <laughs> I, I, I don't even know what to say. No, I don't. Um, all right, I need to gain my composure here, so... What do you think can be done to clean up crypto in regard to scam projects and rug pulls, mostly with these new BEP20 tokens? Yeah, it's core groups of individuals creating um, education and, uh, you know, the EverReflect community, our official channel, we do a lot to try to, to give education, whether it's Excel spreadsheets, whether one-on-one, -on -one, but more groups like that. Like we don't need more shillers and we don't need more, um, you know, groups that are just focused on making a, a quick BNB to be able to like advertise whatever project comes across the, the channel. Yeah. We need more groups like, you know, I, I speak highly of, of, of Tango Crypto Discord because what those gentlemen are doing over there is even even though uh, you know it, they might have a tiered system, the the tiering gives opportunities for people to get into higher education, learning into different classes with individuals that are specific topics. Whether it's just uh, blockchain, whether it's about like uh, trading at launch, whether it's about converting to uh, fiat with the taxation purposes and having CPAs like that stuff is all massive, but we just need more core groups of, you know, I, I'm a big fan of, uh, of the anti ruggers of legit crypto of ignite, like all these subgroups that we just see on telegram and discord and, and find yourself a group like it doesn't, or start a group. Like that's what we really need because you know, our, our core group of like 30 guys still has to vet certain projects and we'll still look at like, okay, what's the, the number of unlocked tokens and what's the, the amount of liquidity going into the liquidity pool from their presale. And 
are they uh, vesting tokens for a long period of time or has you know, the, the team docs itself and are they willing to show their face or even spoke, uh, speak on VC, you know, the education component of knowing how to, as, as a, as a team kind of vet a project and then determine if the team's legit or not, but then you also need to, to be able to take that. And once you find it, and this isn't just a promotion for ever reflect, you need to nurture those teams. Like the toxicity in this space, it needs to be, be tempered down because we are, we're all adults yeah, and we act like, like children. Yeah. And, and, and that, that does more disservice to the price of every token on BSC when people can't seem to keep their emotions in check and then they start just bad mouthing legitimate projects. If you don't like the project, fair enough. If you don't like the, the tokenomics and you don't like the utility, yeah, nobody's fair making enough. You invest, you know, nobody's making no, you, but no. to buy it and then just trash your own investment is just pointless to me. It, well, it's pointless and it's pointless to do it for uh, a legit team that's doxxed because of this reason. Now you're just giving more power to the scammer. You're just creating that, okay, you need to leave this project and you need to go find the next big one and the next big one will launch and then you'll end up like getting 100x and then you're good. It doesn't work that way. You will eventually run into a wall. You will eventually fall down the well. You will eventually get screwed because you can't keep hopping as much as you do and thinking, keep in mind, 92% of all projects that launched last year on BSE scan, uh, BSE were either scams mm. or failed. Yeah. 92% Mike, that means that we're already in a, in a small percentile of 8%. And then our 8%, we want to partner with other, other projects that are bringing real world utility. Yeah, not well, just a utility. Right. And, I want to give so a shout out. To what, yeah, I want to give a shout out to what you guys are doing also with uh, the DeFi roundtable. Uh, if you guys don't yeah. know, EJ and a bunch, a couple other reflection tokens and some social media influencers are going to be getting together every couple weeks and really kind of brainstorming ideas, uh, you know, within the DeFi space and you know, really promoting unity within projects. And I, I think that's going to go a long way with it as well. So I wanted to give you guys a shout out with that. That that's going to be coming this uh, Wednesday at 9 p.m. Yeah, yeah, we're I'm pumped about that, and and uh, you know, big shout out to Chris from MetaBUSD to yeah. be able to organize and set, get that all set up because it's needed. That's that's the stuff where you need community interaction. Not necessarily everybody being like minded on every subject, but right. people being able to have transparent, honest dialogue to advance the space. Absolutely, not not to limit it. And you know what? You know who else I want to give a shout out to on this? I, I think a lot of this responsibility with scam tokens and all also comes down to the launch pads that launched them. Uh, you know, I want to give a shout out to the guys over at DGEM. I had a meeting with them yesterday, and I got to tell you, their vetting process that they use for any, you know, tokens that are launching on their platform, you know, they're really trying to, you know, weed out any of those before they even, you know, come onto the market. And I think that's where a lot of the accountability lies with, you know, launch pads that launch these, you know, crap projects. Yeah. Yep. And in the same thing where it's just supporting, like, I love their dev team. Some of the smartest guys in the space and some of the most humble, which I, I'm always a fan of, of uh, people that have no egos and they have humility, but, but that are willing to, to, to take time to educate other people. And they're also just willing to uh, do it right because doing things correctly takes time. Yeah. And they're willing to take their time to build something that's going to be much, much better in the long run. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, that's good. We got two more questions left, and we're going to keep these as light questions. We cover a lot of uh, right. heavy, heavy stuff here. So tell uh, everybody who your three favorite bands and musicians are. Ooh. Who are you into right now? Um, actually, so if I were to go to to my Spotify, I'm a big country music fan. Yeah, same, um, same so, here. Same here. 
So if I, if I were to go with my current favorite country artist, it's going to be Kip Moore. Okay. Um, and I just went to a concert with him uh, or with my dad and stepmom just a, a few months ago. Um, alternative wise, I love alternative music. I've been uh, a huge fan of the 1975. I don't know if you uh, listen to, they have a, a few, a few albums out, but um, they kind of have uh, like a, a European eighties, 90 kind of sound. And then now give me your guilt. all time favorite. If you were trapped on a desert Island, you could only listen to one band for the rest of your life. Who would it be with the last one? I'm, boy, it's a hard one. Yeah, it really is. Honestly, I might, I might go old school. It's probably going to be greatest hits album between Bruce Springsteen or the police. The boss. Yeah. I mean, I'm a child of the eighties. Same here. So, so I, I would say one of their two albums, just because I've loved like there, there's just so much that, uh, that they've written over the years that like it's, it's easy listening. Cause you get, if you're picking just like one and you want to have them, they have a pretty good uh, collection of songs. So I don't know, but I could, I mean, just as much as that, I could say, you know, there's, there's Todd, like Gavin McGraw to, to um, the weekend. Like I've been listening to a lot of the weekend yeah, recently. He, and I don't really know. Good. It. I don't newer music. I, I don't uh, typically jump into as much, but yeah, I, I love music. Yeah, same, same here. You know, like Pink Floyd's one of my favorite bands, but I think I'd kill myself oh, yeah. if I had to listen to them every day, how depressing it would be. But oh, my God. Yeah. Love them. Oh, sure. Right. Yeah. All right. So now the final question. And All right. I, I hinted that this may be coming, so I, I'm looking for a great answer here. Uh, Which celebrity, historical figure, or literary figure would you most like to fight? If you had a chance, like, I know, I know, I don't see. I'm not like, I don't know if I've really ever been into uh, like a physical fist fight. Right. Fight of, uh, <laughs> I would. <laughs> this is a complete cop out. I would say, I would like to fight it out with Arnold Palmer on the golf course at Augusta. Really? <laughs> like happy uh, Gilmore fit, style like, like <laughs> yeah that's, that's where my that's where my head goes like bob barker <laughs> and, and happy gilmore like fighting yeah. on a green that's but uh, honestly no, i i wouldn't want to i would I, i'd rather play golf with the madagasta but I, that's where my head kind of goes when <laughs> i when you think reading is i think happy gilmore with bob barker so but uh i i highly respect arnold palmer and, and you can picture him needling you and making fun of you a little bit as you're messing out <laughs> that putt and then all of a sudden you guys are just rolling around going at it yeah we could we could fight it in a sand trap and then we could play 18 holes at augusta i love that's what, it that's enough i love it man well there you guys have it that is our initial dirty mike's dirty dozen with uh ever reflect ceo ej um it was very enlightening, and uh, we got a lot of serious stuff. We got some laughs along the way. I will never forget the Sushi Cup of Destiny. <laughs> it may wind its way into the title of this video somehow. But yes, I think it should. That's great. Absolutely. Thank you guys for thank you for joining us. Thank you for you know all the support of the channel, and you know keep up the great work. You guys are doing awesome work over there. Hey, you too, uh, Mike, you're doing a, a noble, uh, amazing thing for the space. And I know you put in a lot of time and a lot of work. So thank you and appreciate you even having me be your first guest. So Awesome, man. Awesome. All right. Well, guys, thank you. And I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this video. I'll have this uh, posted on YouTube within a couple hours. And I will uh, be back again tomorrow. We actually have a full week schedule with these. I'm going to be doing five of these this week. So uh just stay tuned, and we'll uh, be doing a lot more this week. Talk to you guys later.